Once again, it's time to cross the tracks and venture into the Turner Classic Movies underworld. I'm your docent in the dark, Eddie Muller, welcoming you to another trip through Noir Alley. Now, plenty of films are based on the notion of people being in the wrong place at the wrong time and accidentally seeing something they shouldn't. It's a staple of suspense films. But it's a little different when the protagonist sees something they shouldn't and keeps watching night in and night out. That's not an accident. It's voyeurism. And for some inexplicable reason, it was a prominent premise for films in 1954. There was the Barbara Stanwyck thriller Witness to Murder, distributed by United Artists. And of course, there was Alfred Hitchcock's classic Rear Window from Paramount. Surreptitious surveillance is also at the core of today's film, Pushover, a trim and tidy 1954 offering from Columbia Pictures, in which the unwitting objects of the creepy voyeurism are two of the biggest bombshells of the 1950s, Kim Novak and Dorothy Malone. Pushover, in fact, is the film in which studio boss Harry Cohn introduced Kim Novak, launching her, sometimes against her will, into the stratosphere of superstardom. Your place or mine? Surprise me. Pushover is also the rare film based on two novels, both by veteran crime writers, The Night Watch by Thomas Walsh and Rafferty by Bill Ballinger. Walsh's book provided the setup. A trio of cops stake out the apartment of a suspected bank robber. One of these guys, in classic noir fashion, decides that robbing the robber would be not only poetic justice, but a nice alternative to years of dangerous duty for lousy pay. But it's Ballinger's novel that brings in the compelling idea of a cop falling for a gangster's woman. Streamlining the two tales into a seamless narrative is screenwriter Roy Huggins, a genius at terse exposition and snappy dialogue. This is one of the last feature scripts Huggins would write before turning his attention to the small screen, where he became one of the most influential writers and producers in the history of television, creating hit shows like 77 Sunset Strip, Maverick, The Fugitive, and The Rockford Files. Huggins turns this film, which was made under the title The Killer Wore a Badge, into one of the best dirty cop films of the era. And yes, that was a prominent subset of the crime genre. As one of the stars of today's movie said 10 years earlier, in perhaps the definitive film noir, I did it for the money, and I did it for a woman. And I didn't get the money, and I didn't get the woman. Frankly, it's surprising a film this good isn't more well known, especially since it introduced one of the most popular stars of the 50s in a role tailored literally to exploit her sex appeal. Critics at the time sure didn't miss it. Pushover got reviews about as good as an 80 minute genre picture could hope for in those days. And Kim Novak, who was only a 20 year old neophyte, impressed reviewers with her unique blend of blatant carnality and surprising vulnerability. It's a compelling combination, one that pretty much defined Novak's screen persona, as well as her life off screen. If you've seen Kim's legendary 2012 interview with Robert Osborne, you know what I mean. From the day she told Harry Cohn they could change her first name, but not her last, he wanted to rename Marilyn Novak Kit Marlowe, the actress battled to be herself, even as one man after another tried to make her into an object of his desire. She's also an unusually sensitive soul, one who suffered a lot from wearing a big heart right out there on her sleeve. She had virtually no acting experience when she made this movie. But it doesn't matter. Kim Novak is one of those rare performers whose essence burns directly into the film. As she takes her first steps into this dark terrain, co-star Fred McMurray bids adieu to noir. Double Indemnity had shown he could play more than lightweight comedy, but it wasn't until he'd aged into the kind of man he plays in Pushover that McMurray solidified his reputation as a dramatic actor. Harry's gonna die no matter what we do. So what difference will it make if he shows up and he's killed? Yeah, perfect setup for a cop, wouldn't it? I could knock him off, hide the money, and call the meat wagon. No questions asked. Think what that money could mean to us, Paul. To you and me. 
And I thought I was using you. A month before Pushover premiered, audiences saw McMurray in The Cane Mutiny, and there were more great roles to come. There's Always Tomorrow, and The Apartment, not to mention Son of Flubber, and of course, My Three Sons. If Chip and Ernie had seen their dad in this film getting his fuse lit by a sex bomb, well, those boys would have grown up a whole lot faster. By 1954, Noir's classic look was fading away, and the streets of Dark City were being lightened up for future sales to television. But cinematographer Lester White, he didn't get the memo. He'd spent most of the 40s shooting Andy Hardy movies over at MGM, but given a chance by director Richard Quine to shoot an all-out film noir, White outdid himself. It's dark, it's desperate, and it's sexy in the most inappropriate ways. It's also one of the best noir films of the 1950s. Here's Pushover.
Need some help? Maybe you've got the motor flooded. What do I do about it? Want me to try? All right. Shove over. Would you like the show? Yeah. How'd you know I was there? Saw you. Wondered why you were alone. I wanted the same thing about you. Don't seem to be flooded. I'll take a look under the hood. Spark. I'm not. Not enough to start the car. Any suggestions? Yeah, I think you ought to have a mechanic look at it. There's an all-night garage on Normandy. You could call him from a bar over here. All right. I'd feel much better if you weren't with me. That was the idea. Could play the record again, though. Okay. Oh. To get it started? Have to tow it into the shop, ma'am. I can't seem to locate the trouble. How long will that take? That's yeah, hard to say. Got a call you here? Bartender, what time do you close? Twelve o'clock. We don't get much late, Fred. Right, I guess we'll have to call you. Okay. Well. Would you like to take me home? No. Sure. Your place or mine? Surprise me. Oh, yeah. Well, there's a uh, no particular hurry. Why don't you check with the mechanic and call me back? Call it with three, three, four, four, nine. Right. Mine? No, yeah, help yourself. That was with plain water, wasn't it? Uh huh. Sorry? Sorry? For what? Picking me up. Is that what you call it, a pickup? Don't you? Do you uh, get picked up often? Would you care? If I said yes, it wouldn't make much sense, would it? No. I guess it wouldn't. The answer is yes. Would it make any sense if I told you it's never happened before? Maybe. I saw you come into the theater tonight, I... I thought how awful it was. The two of us there all alone. It doesn't make sense. A girl like you. New car, mink coat, perfume, 50 bucks an ounce. It's 100. Still alone. Why? Uh-uh. No questions, don't spoil it. Yeah. How long will it take? Wait a minute. He says the distributor shot. 
Take a couple of hours, maybe longer, to fix it. He wants to know where to deliver it. You tell him. You can deliver it here. 3916 Crescent Way. Apartment D. We're doing the best we can. After all, identifying Harry Wheeler as one of the men who knocked off the bank was no break. It was... Ha yes, sir. All right, sir, as soon as I get it. What about you, Rick? Anything from St. Louis? Wheeler was there until five weeks ago. That's all we got. Nothing on who he left with, why he left? They're working on it. About time you showed. Have you got anything for us? No, well, nothing definite, no. What do you want, another three days with her? I didn't ask for the first three. Okay, Paul. We've been drawing blanks here, too. You can have more time with her if you need it. I'm satisfied she's Wheeler's girl. Oh, why? Well, it seems to add up. We spent a lot of time at my place, never at hers. She obviously has a generous friend who's not around at the moment. Last night, when I tried to take her to the Lombardi Club, she backed off. What's the connection? One of Wheeler's hangouts. You think that's enough to go on? Don't you? It'll have to do. Harris, bring in that layout. Oh, what about the girl? I told her I was going to be out of town for a while. Oh, I got this from the bank yesterday. It's the official count. 210 grand and no record of the serial numbers. This is the layout of the building the girl lives in. And this is her apartment here. We'll take over this one across the way. Be sure you avoid contact with the rest of the tenants. There'll be two men in this room at all times. One on the phone tap, the other at the window. Another man will be in a lookout car out in front. If Wheeler shows, the man in the lookout car phones upstairs, and the other two will be ready for him when he steps out of the elevator. Sounds real simple. It is. If you're asking me, Wheeler's halfway to Peru right now. Oh, that doe and a murder rap hanging over him? Look, get it out of your head that Wheeler won't show. This is all we've got to go on, and I want you expecting him. Did you ever read the statistics on bank jobs, Patty? Ever hear of a heist man being picked up afterward on a highway or international border? They find him holed up in the big city. And 70% of the time, there's a dame with him. How about it, Paul? Think Wheeler'll be around? Yeah, he'll be around. Everything straight, then? How about those back doors they kept locked? They can't be opened from the outside. You'll be in charge of the stakeout, Paul. And you know what I want. You want Wheeler? I want him alive. Remember that, all of you. Dead, he can't tell us where the money is or who his partner was. Alive, he can save us a lot of dirty work. What watch do we take? The important one. I'm putting Briggs, Fine, and Corrick on the day watch. It doesn't figure that Wheeler will show up in broad daylight. Well, I guess that's everything. Pick yourself up a copy of this from Harris. Paul. Keep your eye on Patty. I'd like to see him get his pension. He won't if he slips again. Find Briggs and send him in to me.
Sorry, boys. Been a long afternoon. Anything going? She went out once, Briggs Taylor. Took her car around for a loop job. Might mean something. She's waiting for someone, all right. Doesn't know what to do with herself. Smoked a pack of cigarettes the past two hours. Coffee if you want it. Thanks. All the comforts at home. She getting calls? Nope. Everything's in the log there. Have fun. See you. At 7 a.m. Yeah. 246 called in for. For nothing. You got her? Uh huh. What do you think? You're right, he'll be around. I think she's still a babe like 30 million others. in the joint. Probably the story of a life. You just don't like women, Rick. What keeps you single? Maybe I like them too much. We've seen all kinds since we joined the force. Big girls, hustlers, blackmailers, shoplifters, drunks. You know, I think I'd still get married if I could find a half-honest woman. Must be a few around. Watch yourself. Those few might just be smarter. Ah, what makes a dame like that type with a guy like Wheeler? Money. What else? She's scared. Scared of being hungry and scared of being alone. You can wrap up her whole life in that one word. Money? It's nice, but it doesn't make the world go round. Doesn't it? Do you know anybody that's happily married that hasn't got plenty of it? My old man was. And he had to stand a wolf off all his life. Uh, my folks hated each other. Fighting all the time. It's about the only thing I can remember about them. One long, endless quarrel. And always about money. Never about anything but money. When I was a kid, I promised myself that when I grew up, I'd have plenty of dough. Plenty of it. I'm doing all right. I owe the Chinaman $2.30 on last week's laundry bill. How'd we get out of this? I think I made a nasty crack about women.
Change your mind about going out of town? Yeah. I took my car to have it serviced today. Happened to mention the trouble I had with it. So the mechanic looked at the distributor. He said it hasn't been touched in months. My car didn't start the other night because you did something to it. Why? Can't think of a fast answer? Yeah, I can think of an answer. I saw you walk into the theater. I like the way you walk. As simple as that. Sure, why not? You're a liar. You're also a cop. You need a drink. What do the police want from me? I wouldn't know. Harry wanted me to keep an eye on you. Harry? Wheeler. He's a friend of mine. Harry Wheeler has no friends. He did me a favor once. And you returned it. You didn't do me that big a favor. So you're a friend of Harry's? Yes, sir. From St. Louis. He dreamed up a pet name for me. He did that for a lot of girls. He never called me anything else. What was it? He was kind of nervous when I talked to him on the phone. He gave me a name and address, that's all. A cop! Do you like a cop? Wait a minute, baby. Take it easy. <laughs> Take it easy. These last few days, they weren't all just cop, were they, Pa? No. No, I learned everything I wanted to know that first night. I went on seeing you because I wanted to. But it's over. What happens now? I'm taking you downtown. A man named Ekstrom wants to ask you some questions. Well. It's been weird knowing you. Not that it matters, Paul, but I didn't know that Harry was what he is. He told me he owned apartment houses in St. Louis. You buy you that coat? Yes. Who was his partner? Partner? Yeah, there were two in that bank, John. We only identified Wheeler. I told you we didn't have any friends. I met him at a nightclub in the Strip. He came in alone. He was always alone if he wasn't with me. And you let him set up house for you? All right. He bought me my clothes and my car. And a lease on a decent place to live in. Things I've never had in my whole life. If you'd known where his dough came from, would you still have taken it? Money isn't dirty, just people. How's he getting in touch with you? He'd be crazy to try and you know it. Why? It was just a lucky break that we got a line on you. He probably figures you're clear. Maybe he will try. I suppose my phone's tapped. What happens to Harry if he's caught? He killed a man. And the 200,000? What do you think? I think it's a lot of money. Right now, Harry's got it. That's right. Paul? Go on home. Why? I wouldn't know. Go on before I start thinking about it. I don't want to go, Paul. Not yet. We could have that money, Paul. You and I. Look, Harry's gonna die no matter what we do. So what difference will it make if he shows up and he's killed? A perfect setup for a cop, wouldn't it? I could knock him off, hide the money, and 
call the meat wagon. No questions asked. Think what that money could mean to us, Pa. To you and me. And I thought I was using you. Get out. Get out! Where'd you go? Oh, drove around, going no place. Might have been trying to make a contact or something. She looks a little frustrated at that. Should one of us go down and relieve Patty? Hey, you with me? Huh? I thought one of us ought to go down and relieve Patty. Yeah, yeah, I'll do it. What's she doing? Hanging drapes. Oh, you mean Wheeler's dame. She's sitting over there staring at the wall. There's a little nurse next door, always busy. Hasn't stopped moving for a minute. Hello. What's holding you up? Where are you? The bowling alley. Where else? Don't tell me you forgot about it. I'm sorry, Rick. I did forget about it. I woke up this morning with a fat headache. I think I better skip it today, huh? Sure. Bring yourself some thick black coffee. I'll see you tonight. Right. Why don't you sit down? Give your feet a rest. Oh, all right. Are you? What do you mean by that? You've been looking kind of bad the last couple of nights. Trouble sleeping, daytimes? Yeah, yeah, the... Somebody kitchen in the neighborhood. 
Uh, me, I get home, take a big double shot, and wham, I'm asleep. I'll have to try that. Why don't you get out and relieve Rick? Right. Thank you. Please, thanks a lot for the ride home. I've got to get upstairs. Look, what's your hurry? It's early yet. I'm awfully tired. Uh, thanks, anyway. Now, wait a minute. Look, why don't you go up and get out of that uniform and go out and have a drink sometime? Some other time. Good night. No. Oh, just a minute. Give me back my purse. I'll give it to you when you come down, okay? Now, you're being very childish. Give it to me. No, you're not going to get it. Hey. No, I said. Forget it. It's not worth now, it. Now, wait a minute. You're going to come lady down. said good night. I guess you didn't hear why don't you mind your own business, buddy? I'll give the lady back a purse and take a walk. Look, chum, I don't think it's any of you. Be a nice fella. Catch yourself some air. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. You did that like as if you'd done it before a few times. I, uh, I was a bouncer once a long time ago. Maybe I should learn how it's done. Might come in handy. Wouldn't it be simpler just to avoid that type? I'm grateful for what you did. You never know for sure. Some women like that kind. Oh, well, I don't. Not that it matters, but I didn't have a date with him. I I'm a nurse, and he goes with a friend of mine at the hospital. He offered me a lift home, and I made a mistake and accepted. You don't have to explain it to me. Well, no, it's just that I... I guess I didn't want you to have a bad opinion of me. Don't ask me why. All right, I won't. But shouldn't I offer you a cup of coffee or something? It seems the least I could do. After you learn that hammerlock. I won't need it. My roommate hasn't left yet. She's a nurse, too. Night shift. Maybe some other time. Oh, all right. Oh, good night. Good night. Fast. Take the stairs and go up in the roof. I want to talk to you. Right now. Don't even bother to finish that drink. Sorry for the delay. I got tied up. It's all right. The girl's going out. I'll take her.
Over here, Paul. You win. Couldn't have taken much more. Wondering what was happening. Waiting for the phone to ring and scared of mine. Thinking of you. Wanted to see you, wanting you to call me. I know. This isn't gonna be easy. We've gotta keep our heads every second. Your phone's tapping. There are three men watching you day and night. Harry's coming here. Maybe tomorrow. Tomorrow? That soon? You've got to stop him. How? Oh, I don't know where he is. Well, he'll call first, won't he? Yes, but Well, he... then stall him. And don't answer your phone unless I'm on the tap. Paul, will you listen to me? It doesn't matter if anyone hears. Harry told me exactly what to say when he calls. And if I say anything else, he won't... What did he tell you to say? When he calls, he'll ask me what TV program I'm looking at. If everything is clear, I'll say I'm not looking at TV. You're not looking at TV? Yes, and that's it. He'll show up here 10 or 15 minutes later. Here. Do you think he'll have the money with him? Yes. Can't you tell him to meet you someplace else? No, if I say anything but what he told me to say, it's a signal to run. He'll show up right after he calls? 10 or 15 minutes later. All right. All right, now remember. You're not to answer your phone until after 7 o'clock when I'm on the tap. When Wheeler calls, you give him the all clear. Then you leave fast. One man will tail you, and I'll change places with a man outside. Have you got an extra key to your apartment? No, but maybe Never I... mind. When you go, leave the door open so I can get in. How long do I stay away? You don't come back until you call me first. If it's all over, I'll be there to take the call. If you don't get an answer, stay away. Have you got it all straight? Yes. You sure? Uh-huh. All right, now go down in your car and drive around for a while and then come back. I'll be right behind you. Couldn't I drive to your place? No. No, we can't take any more chances. Now go on. Be careful, Paul. Isn't that the most... Well, you only get out of a sweater what you put into it, I always say. Yeah, you said it twice this morning. Let me have a look. Answer your phone, Blondie. What's going on? Still in the bedroom. She's not gonna answer it. That's funny. Just missed something. What happened? Her phone rang half a dozen times. You just ignored it. How'd she react? Couldn't tell. She was in the bedroom. Maybe she knows her phone's tapped. You're uh, sure she wasn't in the shower or something? Just stood in the bedroom and stared at the phone. Almost hate to leave. This may be the big night. Yeah. I can hardly tear myself away. Well, enjoy the view. I'll see you. Good night. That call was supposed to mean something. She isn't showing it.
Probably a roommate's party. Must be a night off or something. How do you know it isn't her party? She's tired. I saw her come home tonight. She was beat. You'd never know it to look at it now. Ah, this thing will probably go on all night. What do you care? I don't. Maybe I do. I, I find myself watching her like I was a father or something. I wait for her to come home. When she's late, I worry about her. Wonder what she's doing. And uh, who she's doing it with, is that the idea? Yeah, something like that. At least I feel I know her well enough to... I'm gonna answer it. Hello? Good evening, this is the RTV rating service. Uh, would you tell me what program you're watching right now? A TV program, that is? I'm not watching TV. I see. Thank you. Did you ever hear of an RTV rating service? No. See what she's doing. She's gone in the bedroom. She's going out, Paul. This may be it. Like me to take her this time? I'd give my right arm to nail that babe and her boyfriend. Okay, Rick. Go ahead. Good luck. Mobile operator. One moment, please. Mobile operator. Give me WJ82311. Your name and number? Sheridan, Hollywood 95264. Hurry it up, please. Yes, sir. There's no answer, sir. No answer? There's got to be an answer. Try it again. Yes, sir. WJ82311. Your job, that's what's up. If extra flies sorry, out about Paul, this... But all I did... I know. We'll talk about it later. I'll take over in the car. You go upstairs. Sure, Paul. Over there. What is it? Wheeler. He's going in. You gotta call Rick. No, no, Rick's not up there. The girl went out. He's tailing her. Then what'll we do? Well? When he finds out she's not up there, he may get scared and run. If he doesn't, we'll go up and take him there. Come on. Extra don't need to know about what happened, does he? What? Extra. Do you have to know about... If nothing goes wrong, no. Don't 
lose my pension, Paul. But I guess you'll do what you got to do. I'll give you every break I can. If you'd been on the job, I'd have taken him at the elevator, the way Ekstrom wanted it. You better hope nothing goes wrong. Let's go. Where? Downtown. But first we'll pick up the money, huh? You got it in your car? Let's go find out, huh? Have the keys. It's like the whole bundle. What'd you do with your partner, Wheeler? Kill him? Okay, Patty. Close the satchel. He jumped you. What else? Why'd you shoot him? I could have handled him. Well, you're half drunk. For all I knew, he had your gun. Well, what now? I don't know. Exxon will crucify us. He wanted him alive. There'll only be one goat. Me. No. No, there's a way out. Give me a hand, Patty. What are you doing? I'm saving your skin. Tomorrow, I'll drive the car someplace and leave it. They'll find it, and we'll be in the clear. All we have to do is keep our mouths shut. That's the gimmick. Gimmick? You were doing all this for me. Why not? I don't know, but I'd rather lose my pension than when they find Wheeler. Will they find that money, too? What kind of a crack is that? Maybe I'd better call Exum right now. I got to know, Paul. I got to know the money. He'll be there. Sure, it'll be there. Then give me the keys. We'll both drive the car away tomorrow. Okay, Patty. You keep them. We better get back.
I'm, uh, I'm afraid I gave you the wrong impression. I doubt it. No, really. Uh, you, you remind me of someone. <laughs> Haven't you ever met me before? Hundreds of times. I, I don't get it. And you won't, so try someplace else. No, <laughs> you've got the wrong idea. I'm not just fresh. I'm sure that I've met you someplace. What? Uh, will there be anything else, sir? It's me, Paul. Get it done. Is everything all right? There's a complication, but I can handle it. Get back here. What happened? I'll talk to you later. Oh, I'm sorry. We're having a little party next door and ran out of ice cubes. Can I borrow some? I'm sorry. I can't help you. To go, Rick. Another dry run. I, I think she spotted me. Why? She made a call from the Twilight Room, came right back here. Means she spotted me, or knows her phone's tapped, or both. Or neither. Maybe. And you're up kind of late, Lieutenant. Something break? Our man's in town. Spotted in a drugstore on the east side earlier this evening. I hoped you might have him here for me. Well, we hope the same thing. Afraid I haven't. Why not? Dame acts like she knows the phone's tap. Made a call from a bar tonight. Probably totted him off. Then you've been here alone? For the last hour, yeah. All quiet? Her phone rang once, that's all. Check the neighborhood, Sheridan. Parked cars, alleys. I'll wait here a while. All right. What time did you leave tonight, Rick, to tell her? About 10.30. What time did you get back? A minute ago. Why? I phoned here a half dozen times between 10.50 and 11.15. No answer. Same thing from the car parked outside. I gave him a chance to explain. Why didn't he? Talk to Patty? He had nothing to offer either. But he's scared to death. You and Sheridan are fairly close, aren't you? That's right. But I'm not trying to cover for him. Maybe Paul's trying to do it for Dolan. Why? Why not ask Dolan? I'm asking you, and I want an answer. When I followed her, I drove past the lookout car. Patty wasn't in it. When I got to the intersection, I... I saw him going to a bar. I guess that bar was just a little too close. Paul, we got up and get back in the car. Exum talk to you. He knows something's up. What'd you tell him? Nothing I didn't have to, he knew. He doesn't know anything. He just thinks he does. You give me a phony job to get me out of the room. Give me the keys to Wheeler's car. I'll get it out of here while we still got a chance. Come on, give me the keys. We're only making things worse, Paul. I'm going to tell Ekstrom just the way it happened. You're not going to tell him anything. I'm in this too, remember? Why? You were just covering for me. Isn't that right? And Ekstrom will throw the book at me. Who do you think you're kidding? You'll come out sweet as a rose. A hero for trying to protect a buddy. Look, Patty, Ekstrom can't prove a thing. Why throw away your pension? 
Because I spent 25 years being a dumb, honest cop. And I'm stuck with it. Wait a minute. What's the idea? You didn't do anything for me. You're after that dough. That's why you came down looking for me. You knew Wheeler was gonna show. Now, wait a minute, Patty. Nope, we're both going up and tell it just like it is. There's an answer. Come on. Tell them to get here as fast as they can, but no sirens. And keep this from the press boys. I heard a shot. Patty? Dead? Rick, get those people back to bed. We don't want a crowd around here. All right, folks, back on the sidewalk. What's going on, officer? We heard the shot. Just a slight accident. Back on the sidewalk, please. What do you think? I don't know. Potter Burns, his own gun. Why would he kill himself? I didn't say that. Then you think he didn't. Where were you tonight around 11 o'clock? I was upstairs. Why? No, you weren't. We know where Dolan was. Where were you? You know where Dolan was. McAllister saw him. I told him I'd cover for him. I tried to get him on the car phone about 10.30. He didn't answer. I know. The operator gave me the message just now. I uh, came down to see what had happened to him. Found he'd gone over to the bar. He was scared. He kept talking about his pension. I brought him back here. I tried to make him understand I wouldn't say anything. But I uh, guess he wasn't listening. You better get back upstairs. We've still got a job to do here. Yeah. There's not much point keeping the stake out now, is there? You got any better ideas? Change your mind, come with us, Anne. No, you all go on. All right. And have fun. You know the Crawford's number if you need me. Oh, don't worry. All right. Bye. He 
dead. I shot him. What do you mean? Patty Dolan. What happened? I killed him. Poor, dumb, harmless. He pulled a gun on me. It went off. It was an accident. I... Are they after you? No. But everything's gone wrong. Patty and, and that girl downstairs, she, she saw me in your apartment. What girl? The one that lives next to you, the nurse. Does she know who you are? I don't think so. But she'll remember me. She'll remember me good. Paul, look, we've got the money. Why don't we, we get haven't out got now? the money. The car's gone. How? Patty must have moved it. Couldn't move it far. It must be around here someplace close. Maybe we could spot it from up here. McAllister's still down there. You take that side. I'll look over here. Upstairs, Rick. Who tells Patty's wife? That goes at my job. What are they gonna say? Killed himself? What else can I say? Get those people out of there. Anything serious? disappointment to me. Oh? The other night. You were just doing your job. You are a policeman, aren't you? Paul? That's it. Go down to your apartment. Stay there a few minutes and then leave. I want the man who follows you kept out at least an hour. What are you going to do? I'm going to put Wheeler's body where it'll be found tonight. Why? Why take any chance now? Tomorrow I we... can't do it in the broad daylight. And if that girl sees me again, I'm through. When they find the body, the stakeout will be over, and I'll be away from here. Everything's going to be all right. Sure, sure. You have a wonderful way of sidestepping questions. Shall I just stop asking? Right now, yes. But save them for next week. Next week? You wouldn't be asking for a date. I can't even answer that for sure. Is your name in the book? Ann Stewart, with a W. But you better call me at the hospital. After our party tonight, we may be evicted. Was it that bad? I didn't think so, but the people next door apparently did. People next door? You don't mean 423? Yes, why not? What happened? Well, nothing really. I went over to borrow some ice cubes from him. Him? You mean her, don't you? No, I mean him. What time was it? Well, about uh, 11. Is he uh, important? He may have killed a man last week and another tonight. Do you think you could recognize him if you saw him again? Yes, I think I could. And you'll be hearing from me sooner than I thought. Good night. Wheeler was here, in her apartment. When? When you were out looking for Patty. How'd you find out about it? The nurse. She tried to borrow some ice cubes. He gave her a fast brush off. 223, please. Mitchell, when Ekstrom gets in, have him call me. McAllister. Right. Did she identify him? Well, who else could it be? What's the blonde doing? The usual things. If there's anybody in there with her, she doesn't know it. You think the nurse scared him off? 
I don't know. She said he opened the door before she knocked, as if he was leaving. Well, then, when he found out his girl wasn't up there, he probably got nervous. And... Why wasn't she? I can't spot it, but something's wrong somewhere. And what happened to Patty, that doesn't fit either. Dexter must have scared him out of his mind. Do you really think Patty killed himself? If you were going to check out, would you put a 38 slug in your belly? Nobody kills himself like that. Least of all, a cop. I know Patty like I know my own self. He wouldn't have done it, not that way or any other way. And he certainly wouldn't have let Wheeler get that close. Maybe he did. No. You know what I think, Paul? I think whoever killed Patty was right there in the car with him. Sitting right there beside him. Hello? All right, give him a message. Wheeler paid us a visit about 11 o'clock tonight. The lady in apartment 426. Yeah, she went over to the bar some ice cubes. She just came in. Where'd she go? Nowhere. Anything happen over there? No, it's all quiet. Know where she went? To the beach. Looked at the water exactly three minutes, came right back here. Why? Doesn't make sense. Well, she probably figured there was only one man watching her place, wanted to draw him off. Why? Nothing happened over there, and Schaefer didn't see anything outside. slugs in the back. Where? When? Dumped out of a car on 3rd and Wilmer about a half hour ago. 
Doesn't she ever go to bed? We're going over there and get a few answers. You stay here, Paul. We'll go smoother if she doesn't see you just now. McAllister and Ekstrom are on their way over to see you. They'll be there in a minute. They'll ask you a lot of questions, but they don't know a thing, so don't let them scare you. No, I'll be over here. But in case you do see me, you know me. Remember that. All right, Paul. Who is it? Where does he think he's going? What is this, anyway? Routine check. I'd like to ask you a few questions about Terry Wheeler. Get him out of my bedroom. All right. Won't you sit down, Miss McLean? May I? When was the last time you heard from him? Who? Harry Wheeler. Who's Harry Wheeler? He's been getting some space in this week's papers. I'm afraid I don't read the paper. And I don't know anyone named Harry. Don't you have to know a man to give him a key to your apartment? What's that supposed to mean? Harry Wheeler was in this apartment tonight at 11 o'clock. Wasn't even here at 11. No. You were at the Twilight Room. But there was a man here. If it wasn't Wheeler, who was it? If there was anyone here, he broke in. What did Wheeler come up here for? Maybe it wasn't Wheeler. You knew his partner, too, didn't you? No sale. You didn't find what you were looking for, so why don't you let me go to bed? I'm afraid I have some bad news for you, Lona. Wheeler's partner double-crossed him, which means he double-crossed you, too. He shot Wheeler tonight and dumped his body into the street. Which means nothing to me. If I didn't know better, I'd think we were on the wrong track. Call the stakeout. Have him bring over the log. We've been keeping a score sheet on you. We'll go over it together, point by point. Sheridan. Rick. Exxon wants a log brought up. I'll be right over. I might have known. You're just the type. Want me to stick around? Afraid she doesn't like you, Paul. Better wait for us. All right.
Operator, give me the police. Hurry. and 60, Park Crest Hotel, 322 French Street, Code 3. Sheridan. Next from there. Well, you better go over and give them this. A woman of the building, uh, an Ann Stewart, apartment 421. Uh, she just called in. Says she saw the man we're after, whatever that means. Oh, and, yeah, two more cars. She mentioned McAllister, so it may be a break. Yeah, you never know. Okay. Who's there? Miss Ann Stewart? Yes? The police. Can you put in a call? No reason when I can't sleep, I drive. Who pays your rent? I do. How? What about the call you got from RTV? I don't know what you're talking about. It wasn't a rating service, the call. We checked on it. Who was it? If there was a call, I'd ever remember it. Well, if you'll do as you're told, you won't get hurt. What are you going to do? I'll think it over. You've got until tomorrow. But don't try to leave unless you want to be picked up and booked for vagrancy. Get your coat. Come on, come on. Sheridan? Guess he went downstairs. Yeah. Yes? Paul, open up. Turn the lights on first. Good rest. We're getting out of here. Go on, hurry. Where's Sheriff? Upstairs. If he was upstairs, I wouldn't be asking you about him. Did he just give you a message? What are you talking about? What message? Woman called. Said she saw the guy we're looking for. What was her name? Stewart. 420... <laughs>
All right, now go on. Hold on a second. Sheridan, the blonde, the girl who just called in, they're all missing. You and Schaefer searched the building, top to bottom. Where are we at? Maybe Paul Sheridan. Pick a prowl car and cover the back. <laughs> behind Wheeler's. Do you think they know it's Harry's car? I don't know. Maybe they just happened to park there. There's one way to find out. Here. That car over there. Here's the key to the trunk. Open it. You'll find a bag. Bring it here. Take it. Be smart. Don't turn around. When I fire, get behind the car. Duck. It's clear that way. Go to Western and Wilshire. Wait for me there. What are you going to do? I'm going to get that car. Now go on, hurry. Wait. You can't get that money. Will you go, Please Laura? don't try. Get the car. Radio Joy Street emergency. Sorry, Rick. So am I, Paul. So am I.
Director Richard Quine was specifically chosen to direct Pushover because the studio believed, having been an actor himself, he'd show special sensitivity to Kim Novak in her first movie role. Quine was 33 years old when he directed this picture, with a number of films, mostly comedies, already under his belt. In his younger days, he'd been a dancing and goofing sidekick to his pal Mickey Rooney. And before making Pushover, he'd guided Rooney through one of his finest dramatic performances in the terrific Drive a Crooked Road. Now, these two pictures were Quine's only forays into film noir, but his personal life had more than its share of darkness. In 1943, Quine had married Susan Peters, one of the most promising young actresses in Hollywood. On a New Year's Day hunting trip in 1945, Peters' rifle accidentally discharged, and the bullet shattered her spine and left her paralyzed below the waist. Now, despite the couple's gallant efforts to overcome this tragedy, Peters even starred, confined to a wheelchair in The Sign of the Ram, their marriage fell apart. They divorced in 1948, and Peters steadily deteriorated, essentially starving herself to death in 1952. Although Quine said he would always be haunted by the accident and Peters' tragic fate, he carved out a reputation for making lively comedies, many in collaboration with writer Blake Edwards. He reunited with Kim Novak in 1958 for the big hit Bell Book and Candle, and it was during its production the director and actress began a love affair. Despite Quine still being married, though separated, to his second wife, Barbara Bushman. By the time Quine and Novak made their third picture together, 1960's Strangers When We Meet, Quine's masterpiece in my opinion, he divorced Bushman and he and Novak were engaged. Columbia Pictures intended to make a wedding present of the fabulous experimental house in Malibu that it had built for the film. But Novak, always fighting to be her own person, felt unduly pressured, and she backed out. She and Quine would make another picture together, The Notorious Landlady, in 1962. But their relationship was over. Now, he'd have romances with other actresses he directed, notably Judy Holliday, Natalie Wood, and Fran Jeffries, to whom he was married for five years. It appeared he'd finally found stability with his fourth wife, Diana Balfour, whom he was married to for 12 years. But in 1989, Quine committed suicide in their Beverly Hills home, shooting himself with a hunting rifle in a manner eerily like the incident that crippled Susan Peters. Okay, I don't want to end on such a down note, so let me tell you a quick story about my own experience with Kim Novak. I had the pleasure of spending time with her on the final TCM Classic Movie Cruise in 2016, during which Kim delighted a couple of packed houses with tales from her career and heartfelt revelations about her personal life. Now, over the years, Kim has gotten tagged with a reputation for being difficult. But I can attest that this comes not from any sort of arrogance or ego, but more from an incredibly sensitive and often insecure nature. She doesn't want to disappoint anybody especially herself. There's an honesty and truthfulness about Kim that's rare among actors, most of whom never let you see their real selves. Okay, given all that, I was dying to ask Kim about pushover, in particular, her costuming, which, despite the vigilance of the production code, didn't leave much to the imagination. And I have to tell you, no matter how relaxed and comfortable you may get with an interview subject, you never lose the fear that the wrong question might turn them against you. So I needed to make sure my eyes weren't deceiving me when she doffs her coat in that first scene in Fred McMurray's apartment. So I sheepishly ask, am I mistaken or were you not wearing a brassiere in that scene? And Kim didn't bat an eye. Honey, I never wore a bra, ever. So there you go, movie magic. Now, next week on Noir Alley, I'll be presenting a film that for decades had vanished from circulation, despite being the best adaptation of an Ernest Hemingway novel ever. Thankfully, it's been restored, revived, and rediscovered. And if you haven't seen The Breaking Point, you're in for an unforgettable experience. Until then, keep up the conversation on our Noir Alley Facebook page and Twitter feed. And hey, I may not get the money, and I may not get the woman, but in Noir Alley, I can always get the drink. See you next week.